so that we can be free. We're singing about him. Sing this with me. Say, he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Sing that again. Yes, he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Well, unto us the child is born, the king Lord of Lords, and He shall reign forevermore, forevermore. Yeah. Just invite you to worship Him this morning. Sing to Him.
child is born, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall. You guys can go ahead and be seated. But it is, it is hard to believe that Christmas is here. Like we are six days away from Christmas. I, I feel like the year 2021 just started a few months ago, but here we are, we're almost to Christmas. And I'll admit, growing up as a kid, Christmas was about the gifts. Christmas was about the presents. And if, if you were to ask me as a kid, I would say, oh, Christmas, it's all about Jesus. But really on the inside, all I really cared about was getting the presents, getting the toys, getting the games uh, that I wanted. And so during Christmas, I was really good. I was well behaved. I was super sweet so that I would get those gifts. And so I would make out a Christmas list of all the things that I wanted. But this year, gifts have looked a little bit different. And so leading up until Christmas, uh, these last few months, we've been worried and, and thinking about um, Sammy in, in the last few months of her pregnancy, and then um, Tatum being born on December 1st. And so my gift this year is a gift of being a father, the gift of a daughter, which is still kind of hard to believe for me to hear father in my name. It just doesn't, doesn't seem right. But she is, she's a blessing. She is so cute. She's adorable. You guys saw the pictures. Even though she didn't sleep very well last night and she kept me up. Um, and so if I get caught up on my words, I'm just going to blame Tatum. Um, that's just my, my go-to default um, excuse going, for going forward. But we are now in our time of communion. And typically when you think and, and talk about communion, you talk about Jesus. You talk about the sacrifice that he made for you and for me. The life that he lived perfectly and rightfully so. I think it is vital, it's super important to talk about what Jesus did for us on the cross. But ever since becoming a father, I have kind of this newer perspective. I have this perspective now of, of the heavenly father sending his one and only son to die in my place and in yours. And I can tell you guys that I would not send my daughter for you. Whether I know you or not, I'm not going to send my daughter for you. I cannot imagine the agony, the pain that I would feel sending my only daughter, Tatum, for you. But that's what sets our God apart. That he sent his one and only son. He loved us that much that he sent his son for you. And so as you came in this morning, you should have been handed a cup containing the elements the bread representing his body, the juice representing his blood. And so Christmas, it is about gifts, but it's about the gift that the Heavenly Father sent his one and only Son for you and for me. That's the gift that truly matters. So let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for this morning, just the, the opportunity to to gather together, to laugh, and, and to have a good time, to sing um, during this joyful Christmas season. And I know I talked about as a kid, you get caught up in the wrong things. You get caught up in the material things, the worldly things. But help us to remember the true gift, the gift that really matters. And that is you sending your one and only son to die in our place so that we could be in relationship with you. God, thank you for loving us that much that you were willing to make that sacrifice. God, we love you and we praise you. And it's your name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand, stand with us. We're just going to sing this little Christmas time worship chorus. I just invite you as, as you have just taken those pieces of bread and that, that cup as you have remembered the sacrifice that he made. Let's just adore him this morning. If you'll just sing along with him. Praise his name forever. 
every voice lifted up. This is probably my favorite week of the entire year. I love Christmas time. I'm excited for our services on the 23rd and the 24th. As Zach mentioned earlier, uh, you have an invite card in your chair. and We'd love to encourage you to take one of those cards and invite somebody to come and celebrate Christmas with us this week. But today, we are going to continue on in this series that we started up a couple of weeks ago called Home for Christmas. And we've already, we've talked about the city of Jerusalem. We looked last week at the town of Nazareth, and then this week what we're going to do is look at the village of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was small. It only had about 300 people in in, in the town whenever Jesus was born. It was a a town that that people would leave and go to bigger cities because of opportunity. In Luke chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. And it was because of this census that everybody had to go to their hometown to register. And so for Mary and for Joseph, it meant that they were going to have to go to this town of Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, it's not exactly the kind of place that you would expect Jesus to be born. It's not the kind of of city where people would be looking for the promised Messiah. And so why is it? Why, Why would God choose Bethlehem? It's this tiny village in the shadow of Jerusalem. It really didn't seem to have a whole lot to offer. I think it's just one of the many parts of the Christmas story that that just doesn't make sense to us. In fact, there's a lot of different things that almost make it seem like God hadn't really thought this thing through. Because if he had, then Christmas on that, that first Christmas would have gone so much smoother. But if you read through the Old Testament, we see that God had indeed thought this thing through. In fact, God, he had put this whole plan of Christmas in motion in the third chapter of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3, you've got Adam and Eve, and they both sin. And their sin separates them from God. And it's in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15 where we first read about the promise of a coming Messiah. That's actually the start of the Christmas story. And there's thousands of years that come and go. And there's hundreds of very specific prophecies all pointing out to a very well thought out plan. God has clearly thought this thing through. But it's kind of hard for us to understand the way that he was thinking. But let's look at Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 through 9. God, he says to Isaiah, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything that you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And so God, he he says, the way that you would do things isn't necessarily the way that I would do things. And the way that you think, that's not necessarily the way that I would think. So what I want us to do today is I want us to look at the Christmas story through this lens. Because whenever we do, we see that just because God doesn't necessarily do things the way that we would... It doesn't mean that his ways can't be trusted. And I'm sure that Mary expected things to go differently. When an angel comes and appears to you and says that you're going to be the mother of the long-awaited Messiah, I'm sure that she assumed that God was going to go ahead and take care of all the details. You know, I'm sure that she thought that there was going to be some perks that come along with being the, the mother of the Son of God. But on that Christmas night, I'm sure that Mary had to wonder, God... What, what are you thinking? This, this isn't the way that I thought that it would be. But God's ways are not our ways. And nowadays we, we look back on the Christmas story and we kind of view it like a Hallmark movie. We play our Christmas music and we put up our lights and our decorations and we remember that journey from Nazareth over to Bethlehem. 
And we say things like, oh, how, how sweet. You know, they're, they're staying in a stable and the cattle are lowing. You realize that lowing means mooing. There is a cow in the delivery room. That is a problem. <laughs> but we tend to think of it as this, this peaceful and this wonderful experience. And I'm sure that Mary and Joseph must have thought, God, what are you thinking? And of all places, why Bethlehem? Why not Rome? Why not Greece? Why not Athens? You know, that, that's the kind of place that a king should be born. Or, or why not even Jerusalem? It's just a few miles down the road. And I'm sure that Mary and Joseph, they must have felt these things. And as they walked out the doors of that stable, they would have been able to see the palace of King Herod. At this time, it was the third largest palace of the day. And it was built just a few miles outside of Bethlehem. And this palace was over 90 feet tall. And it spread out over 45 acres. It was a, a palace that was meant to make the statement of a great king. It was meant to say, King Herod the powerful, the, the wealthy, the mighty. And I wonder if on that first Christmas, if Mary and Joseph stepped out of their stable holding the, the king of kings. And they looked up at this palace and they said, God, are you, are you sure about this? Why Bethlehem? Why a stable? Max Lucado, he wrote a piece where he tries to imagine a prayer that Joseph might have prayed on this first Christmas night. It reads, this isn't the way that I planned it, God. Not at all. My child being born in a stable? This isn't the way that I thought that it would be. A stable with sheep and donkeys, hay and straw? My wife giving birth with only the stars to hear her pain? This isn't at all what I imagined. No, I imagined family. I imagined grandmothers. I imagined neighbors gathered outside the door and friends standing at my side. I imagined the house erupting with the first cry of the infant and slaps on the back and lots of laughter. That's how I thought that it would be. The coming of the angel I've accepted. The questions that people have asked about the pregnancy, I can tolerate. The trip to Bethlehem, fine. But why a birth in a stable, God? And maybe Joseph never prayed a prayer like that, but can we be honest? Haven't we? Not outside of a stable, but maybe outside of an emergency room door. I know that I've prayed a prayer just like that before. Or maybe it was in a courtroom. Or maybe it was in a, an empty, quiet sanctuary like this one. Maybe it was on the, the lawn of a cemetery wherever you prayed a prayer and said, God, what are you thinking? This, this isn't the way that things are supposed to go. Things were supposed to turn out differently. And maybe this Christmas you wouldn't say it out loud, but in your heart you kind of find yourself second-guessing God because you thought that you'd be married by now. You, you thought that by this Christmas you would have found a job. Maybe you, you thought by this Christmas you would be pregnant. Maybe you, you thought that your family would have turned things around by now and you, you're more than aware of the fact that your thoughts are not the same way that, that God's thoughts are. And you want to have faith. You, you truly you want to believe, but it's just so hard to understand. And so really it's not that tough for you to look at the Christmas story through this, this lens of Isaiah chapter 55 because you don't understand. This isn't the way that you would have done things. And so today as we look at Bethlehem, we kind of find ourselves looking at our own stories and we ask ourselves the question, why? In Bethlehem, it teaches us something about faith. It, it teaches us something about the glory of God. And so here's the question, why Bethlehem? And here's the answer. The answer is because God can. Because God can. God's power is so great that he doesn't need Rome to accomplish his pur purpose. No, Bethlehem will do just fine. God, he does some of his best work in places just like Bethlehem. And so whenever you think that you've got nothing to offer, that's where God can do some of his best work. Bethlehem, it was just this insignificant town that was only made significant because God chose to make it significant. In fact... In the Old Testament book of Micah, whenever the prophet Micah would predict the coming of the Messiah, he was going to go to great lengths to point out its insignificance. He says in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 in the message paraphrase, it says, But you, Bethlehem, David's country, the runt of the litter, from you will come the leader who will shepherd rule Israel. Bethlehem was just this suburb of Jerusalem. It, it sat right outside of the city. 
And it's not the kind of place that you would even tell people that you were from if you were outside of that area because there's no way that people would have ever even heard of it. And so you would say that you're from a a small town right outside of Jerusalem. It was just a shepherd's village which on its own would have brought some shame. Because back in this culture, a shepherd was one of the lowest titles that a person could hold. But that's where Jesus was born and I think it's one of the most beautiful parts of this entire Christmas story. Bethlehem is just one of the many things where it looked like God was purposely stacking the deck against himself. And then he says, hey guys, watch this. It's called the Bethlehem effect. And I've only got one main point for us to see today. And it comes from this Bethlehem effect. And it is this. What God did on that first Christmas is what he can do for us today. What God did on that first Christmas is what he can do for us today. He will sometimes choose the most unlikely places to do the most incredible things. He'll sometimes, he'll take the most ordinary people and he'll do some of the most extraordinary things. He'll step into circumstances that seem to be impossible and what he'll do is he'll turn it into Christmas. And that's what God does because God can. And so we never lose faith. We never lose hope. We worship a God who can. And this is something that we see all throughout the Christmas story, but it's not just in the Christmas story. We also see it in Luke chapter 2. Whenever the the birth of Jesus is announced, it wasn't announced to any kings or rulers or anybody else that the world would have viewed as somebody being uh, uh, popular or powerful. Let's dive in. Let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. It says, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And I don't know if any of us can fully understand how insignificant and how unimportant shepherds were back in this day. There's there's nothing in our society that even compares to it. These people would have been considered less than people. They, They worked with animals. They ate with animals. They slept with animals. They smelled like animals and as and and as animals. And as a result, they were treated like animals. People they would look down on the shepherds. And just imagine what it must have been like in heaven. You've got all of heaven, and heaven is excited. This big moment has finally came. Everything that has led up to this point where God is about to send his son into the world in the form of a baby. And I'm sure that the angels, they they come to God and they ask, God, we're we're, we're ready. Who is it? Who do you want us to tell? Who are the kings? Who are the rulers? Give us us the list of people that we're going to tell. And God says, well, do you see those shepherds down in the field? That's who I want you to go and tell. And so why the shepherds? Well, it's because he can. And I think that is really good news for you and for me. He can take people who are forgotten and overlooked by our culture and he can give them a value. He can give them purpose. Because that's what our God does. And this wasn't the first time that God picked some unimportant shepherd to play an important part in his story. You see, there was another story that took place in these very same fields back in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Samuel was going to go to the house of Jesse and he was going to select who was going to be the second king of Israel. Now Samuel, he's not been told by God which one of Jesse's sons it's going to be. He just knows that it's going to be one of his sons. And Jesse, he's got lots of different sons. And so he, he calls them all in and he has them stand in a line. And I'm, I'm sure that he stacked up his sons in order of importance. You know, it probably started with ones that were the most mature and the most prepared and the most experienced. And so Samuel, he he starts to work his way down the line and he gets to the end of the line and and God hasn't revealed that it's any of these sons. And so Samuel, he says to Jesse, he says, well, do you have have any more sons? Is there maybe something out back that I could look at? And Jesse says, yeah, well, you know, there's there's one more son, but he's the youngest and he's out in the fields taking taking care of the sheep. Samuel says, well, I want you to go and get him. 
And so Jesse, he sends for David and David comes back in and God, he says to Samuel, he says, this is the one. This is the shepherd that's going to be the next king. And I wonder if those shepherds out in the fields outside of Bethlehem on this first Christmas, I wonder if they thought back to the shepherd who was picked to be the next king of Israel. But then the angel appears before these shepherds and, and makes this huge announcement. And so why the shepherds? Well, it's because God can. That's how powerful God is. When verses 15 and 16, our story continues and it says... When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and they found Mary and Joseph. And there was a baby lying in a manger. And you know, it's not really just why Bethlehem. And it's not just why the shepherds, but it's also why Mary. You know, I I wonder if the shepherds were surprised by this whole setting. You've got a a baby that's lying in a manger. And you've got this young teenage girl that's in a stable. And so why is it? Why would God choose Mary? Because if you stop and you think about it, she really doesn't have much to offer. She was from the town of Nazareth. There was nothing about her that would have really stood out on a resume. She didn't have any qualities about her that seemed important or gifted. And the Bible really doesn't tell us a whole lot about Mary. I think we've tried to make a whole lot more out of her than what we read in Scripture, but we just truly, we don't know that much about her. You know, she's very rarely given a speaking part, and really about the only time that we even read about her in the, in the Bible is right here in the Christmas story. So why did God choose her? And I think it's interesting that her and Joseph, they were so poor that they didn't even have enough money to offer up the sacrificial lamb whenever they took Jesus to the temple when he was eight, eight days old to be dedicated. No, instead what they had to do is they had to buy two doves. The Levitical law in which they would have followed back then said that you had to buy a sacrificial lamb, but they couldn't afford it. And so do you see the irony in that? They didn't have enough money to buy a sacrificial lamb for the one who's going to end up being the sacrificial lamb. And so is this, is this really the best person to be the mother of the Son of God? She's not married to a ruler. She's not married to a king. She's married to a simple carpenter. Should she really be the one that's entrusted with training and teaching the Son of God? So God, why would you choose Mary? Well, it's because he can. And why would he choose you? And why would he choose me? It's because it gives God an opportunity to demonstrate his power and to show us his grace. Our God, he can use anyone. That's just how powerful our God is. The Apostle Paul, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse 27, he says, instead God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. And that's who God chooses. And he does it to demonstrate his power and to show his grace. And that's how God has always worked. It's called the Bethlehem effect. God, he chooses some of the most ordinary people to accomplish some of the most extraordinary things. And so for Abraham, he waited until Abraham was old. For Jacob, he was insecure. Leah, she was the least attractive of two sisters. Moses stuttered. Gideon was poor. Samson was proud. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an innocent man killed. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah was disobedient. Naomi was a widow. John the Baptist was weird to say the least. Peter was impulsive and he was hot tempered. Martha worried a lot. The Samaritan woman, she had several failed marriages. Zacchaeus was unpopular. Thomas had doubts. The Apostle Paul, he had lots of health problems. And the list, it goes on and on and on of people that God chose to use. He chose the the least likely of people to do some of the most incredible things that we read in the Bible. It's the Bethlehem effect. And whenever you read through the Christmas story and you wonder, God, what are you thinking? Why would you do it this way? We come to find out. These things, they don't actually make God look like somebody who forgot to check to make sure there was enough room in the end. No, instead, they show us that we serve an all-powerful God who can work in any situation to accomplish his purpose. I think if Jesus would have been born in a big city, then maybe people would have said, well, you know, 
Right time, right place, look, look what faith can do. If he would have been born into wealth, people might have been tempted to say, well, look what money can do. If he would have been born into a famous family, people could have said, well, look what fame can do. If Jesus would have been born the, the son of a king, people would say, well, look what power can do. But he wasn't. Jesus was born in a nothing town called Bethlehem to a teenage girl named Mary whose fiancé was nothing more than a carpenter. And then he was laid to rest in a manger. And you read through this Christmas story and there's only one conclusion to reach and it's this. Look at what God can do. And if God can do it for Bethlehem, then he can do it for Jacksonville. And if he can do it for the shepherds, then he can do it for you and he can do it for me. And if God can do it for Mary, then maybe, just maybe, God would choose us. And that's the good news of Christmas. Look at what God can do. And he removes all the worldly props and he knocks out all the different possible crushes because our God, he doesn't need any help because our God can. And I think sometimes what we do is we look at our life and if we're honest, we'd have to say, God, what are you thinking? You know, things haven't turned out the way that I thought that they would. God, my, my future, it's really uncertain right now. Financially, I'm not, I'm not sure how we're even going to make it. Or maybe it's the job. And you say, God, I've been looking for a really long time. God, what is it that you're thinking? Or maybe as a, a parent or as a grandparent this Christmas, you're, you're just feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling exhausted. This isn't the way that you thought things would be. You thought that things would be different than this. And you're very aware of the fact that whenever your family all gets together this Christmas to celebrate that your family could turn out to look a whole lot like a reality TV show. And you just feel tired. You feel like you've got nothing to offer. You feel worn out. And you say, God, this isn't the way that I thought things would be. I thought it was going to be different. I thought that my life would unfold differently. Well, today, I bring you good news of great joy. Because today, in the town of Bethlehem, there is a Savior that has been born to you, and He is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. We are so thankful that we serve a God who can. And Father, we thank you that you loved us enough that you sent Jesus. And for those who are hurting today, those who are struggling in this Christmas season, Father, I pray that you show hope. I, I pray that we will see the hope that can be found in you, how you can work in situations that seem helpless, and you can bring about enormous kingdom good. And so God, help us to not lose focus this Christmas season. Help us to focus on the one who can. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thank you all for worshiping with us this morning. You can continue to worship by giving of your tithes and offerings. And you can do so by dropping your tithes and offerings in the giving wall uh, by our back to exits, or you can drop your tithes and offerings in the giving drop boxes out in the lobby. Or if it's easier for you to do it online, you can visit our website, 1c.church. And if it's your first time joining us, worshiping with us this morning, we are glad that you're here. We are glad that you joined us. And we would encourage you after the service, go out into our lobby in the Next Steps area, and we have a gift for you. And we would love to introduce ourselves and get to know you. And just a reminder, make sure you grab those cards on your way out in that next Sunday morning services. We only have to 8 and 10 o'clock. So hope you guys have a great Christmas weekend.